He's the executive director for the North American Deer Farmers Association. He's been involved with various animal health programs and the regulations to govern them for 20 years. Sean is a current member on the board of directors for the U United States Animal Health Association. He's also a past director on the North Dakota State Board of Animal Health. Sean sits on the advisory board for the North Dakota State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, as well as on the external advisory board for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Center of Excellence for Emerging and Zoonotic Animal Diseases at Kansas State University. Sean Schaefer. Uh, I already had the introduction there. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is uh, after 14 years on the North Dakota State Board of Animal Health, uh, I did term out, uh, no longer could be, uh, could sit in that, uh, area, so uh, Chris Reichman here has replaced me in that time, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, he'll do a, a good job there too as well. Quick little history uh, as to uh, why and when the farm servant industry started. I don't know how many people are aware, but uh, Farmer's Bulletin 330, everybody's got Google these days, just punch that up and it give you a lot better history than I can, but Farmer's Bulletin uh, 330 will uh, give you a lot of good information uh, back in 1908 when uh, President Teddy Roosevelt instructed his uh, Secretary of Agriculture and his Chief of uh, the Biological Survey to uh, explore and uh, instrument uh, deer farming. So uh, a lot of neat little history there and uh, it's just amazing the, the information that goes into, talks about how, talk, uh, how President Roosevelt actually raised deer for 17 years uh, himself. So. And here we are, 1997 to 2018. Uh, in December of 1997, there was a lot of unanswered questions as to how CWD was truly going to affect deer and elk, both wild and farmed. 21 years later, there are still a lot of questions that need to be answered and issues that uh, have not been addressed. So I'd like to thank the uh, organizers of this second Texas CWD Symposium. I was here for the first one as well. Uh, did not get to speak at that one, but uh, for allowing the servant industry to discuss issues that we have faced in the past as well as what we have ahead of us. So many times, uh, you know, we're looked at and pointed at, I think, and everyone, when we discover uh, CWD on a new facility, everyone's wondering, what did we do? Where did we move it in from? How did we get it? You know, and, uh, and, and I think so often, you know, we're that, we're that canary in the coal mine. You know, and, and I think we get blamed for breathing up all that air in that coal mine, and, that, and that's really not the case, I don't think, you know, and uh, so, and, and I, I will take blame, and I will say uh, this, this industry has moved disease around this nation. There is no getting around that, um, around this, this continent. Uh, if you look at the majority of these dots, Brian Richards still here? What a map. Uh, and, and, I, and I hope everybody that ever has to put a presentation together and ever needs a map for anything We'll go to USGS CWD map and get the latest, greatest updated map. Uh, I don't have, uh, mine is as of November, so I'm a little off. But there are other maps out there. I fought hard, I crusaded hard in the early years to switch the, late, the way this was looked at. Because a lot of people in the early years when the first map came out, they shaded in the entire state when it was farmed in a farm servant. When it was found in a farm servant within a fence, the entire state would be shaded. Oklahoma, for instance, uh, that had a case back in, I think, uh, 1999 or 2000, was entirely shaded in for one or two elk. The same with Montana, you know, and uh, so the entire state, yet when they would find it in the wild, they'd have a little tiny dot, like that, somehow that animal was contained to that little tiny dot where it was found or harvested. So uh, we worked hard to get this flipped around. I don't know if I ever had any influence on Brian's work, but uh, he did a heck of a job. Um, the one thing I do want to point out to him, uh, he, he said that he was not going to remove New York's dot. I'll probably support that. But at the same time, uh, why don't we have Toronto's dot on here? So uh, a lot of people forget that history, that there were deer moved from Denver, the Denver Zoo, I believe it was. There was mule deer shipped up to the Toronto Zoo that came down CWD positive, you know, in the uh, 1900s there. Uh, uh, 1996, 90, earlier, probably, probably earlier than that. So anyway, uh, 
that dot's been removed. I'd like to see that probably added back on if we're going to maintain Montana's dot here, because this is over 20 some years. Oklahoma's dot's over 20, you know, over 20 years. Um, you know, maybe there is a point where we should change them to a white dot instead of a yellow dot or something. I mean, maybe with age or something, we could color code this uh, map to add a lot better information. Because uh, also, a lot of these dots in the farmed industry are prior to the certification program. Prior to December 1997 is when I attended my first CWD meeting. I bought my first deer January 5th of 1998, so a month later. Uh, February 1998, I started CWD in the CWD monitoring program. Um, so prior to that announcement of CWD coming out of the closet in December 1997, the farm servant industry, as well as I, I will say it, I don't think any wildlife agency as well, other than Colorado and Wyoming, tested for CWD. So we didn't know what, there was that, what that acronym, acronym even stood for. Um, so prior to that, that announcement of CWD, we did move a lot of these, these dots is where they came from. Uh, the neat thing about it is to this day, a lot of these dots still don't have CWD around them in the wild. Uh, I heard a comment about the New York one yesterday and how it possibly spilled over from that uh, into the wild. I know exactly how it spilled over from that facility into the wild. He was a wildlife rehabilitator. He was not a deer farmer. He was a taxidermist and a wild, wildlife rehabilitator. He raised those fawns that were brought to him by his DNR uh, back up to whatever age, and then he took them out and he released them back into the wild after he had them in his garage with the same salts and everything else that he was doing, working on his hides and exposed all those infectious materials of animals that he received from all over the country, and then they turned them back out into the wild. So thankfully, they went out and they were able to, to harvest a whole bunch of those animals, and to this date, they have never found another one. So that is a good thing. But a lot of these dots can be explained. Um, I've heard mention that, uh, that the certification program is not working, and I would argue that. You know, I've been in the program for 21 years, the certification program, monitoring over time, you know, and, and Mitch's talk today was excellent, um, and, and I agree, going out and testing the 4% death loss that you have this one year is not enough for you to be able to move animals around and say that you're, you're clean. Monitoring that death loss forever is where we gain that confidence level. The longer you do it, the better your confidence level is. It is a monitoring program, though. It is not a vaccine. It is not a cure. It is not a preventative. It prevents you from hopefully introducing it from someone else, but it does not prevent it from coming through the fence or some other environmental mean, and uh, I'll get to that later on in the presentation. But we, uh, I, I know a lot of these dots personally. That's the sad part about this. I know these people by name, you know, and, and I can sit and ask those guys. When I sit and look at Missouri, the owners of Heartland, uh, and apologize if I pointed the wrong states, um, but Missouri, we sit and we look at, you know, how did it get here? And we hear, you know, they tested 30-some thousand samples prior to Heartland discovering CWD. 30,000 samples over 10 years, 3,000 per year. There's over 100 counties in the state of Missouri. That's 30 deer per county. 30 deer per county is not going to tell you that there was not CWD in in Macon County before Heartland found it. What I can tell you is knowing the owners and knowing the people that sold to Heartland, in the eight years since, none of them have came down to CWD. CWD is a devastating disease that we need to take serious and we need to work to control. But uh, the neat thing about the disease is within two to three years, it devastates these captive herds, you know, and you know, if left unmanaged, if left unmanaged. And to this day, not one herd that ever sold to Heartland has ever came down with CWD. That's a neat thing to know. Um, we, are, we have moved disease, I will admit that. Like I said, we just had one last year. We moved one from Pennsylvania to Wisconsin. They harvested that animal and they found it. Uh, they, we, I, think, I think before they even found that one, they had found it in his herd as well, and they made an announcement the trace that was already there. He already harvested it, already was discovered. So... Did it slip by us for a few days? Yes, but the system still worked. They still found it. Is it perfect? No, but they did find it. So um, we'll move on from there. 
Challenges, there are uh, still many states that allow unregulated movement of hunter-killed carcasses and poor uh, disposal methods. I'm going to throw up a few map, uh, maps. I apologize for these being blurry. I uh, borrowed them from other sites. Uh, but this is just a map that the uh, South Dakota Game and Fish put together. And what they're talking about is their little CWD core area here in the Black Hills. And this is just 2017 of this tiny state of South Dakota that only harvests something like 80,000 uh, deer total statewide. But uh, they're non-resident license holders from 2017. This is where they all were from. You know, here we are in the state of Texas. Uh, a lot of Texans, not a lot of Texans, a handful of Texans, do go up here. Let's hope like heck that they didn't bring anything back. I'd assume that they didn't. But, uh, but that risk is always there. Um, Brian Richards, again, he put together one heck of a map here, and I, I would challenge every state to do this. I really think this is what needs to be done, just like uh, um, South Dakota did for Black Hills. Uh, Brian Richards did for uh, Wisconsin's four counties. So this is only to do with four counties, but the red dots on the map are the home zip codes of every hunter who harvested at least one of them deer in Wisconsin. Uh, there's 32,000 dots, I believe, there. Um, so out of the 32,000 deer that were harvested, only 7% were tested. Of the 7% that were tested, 17 were positive, 17% were positive. So 29,000 deer were not tested. 2,291 of those dots were tested but of the 29,000 that weren't at 17% infection rate, that's 5,000 positive deer, if my math is correct, that potentially left. Now hopefully they have restrictions in place. You, a lot of states have restrictions in place that say you can't bring these back. We know things happen. We know things happen. You know, I hope like heck that that was a perfect system and I hope that nobody of those 29,000 brought anything back that they weren't supposed to. Look at that. Somebody shot off my pointer on me. So anyway, uh, but that risk is there. And that's only four counties in the whole entire state of Wisconsin. Those 32,000 zip codes that we're looking at there are only from four counties. We heard yesterday there's 20 some, you know, there was 50 some infected, but actually 20 some positive counties. Um, I really would challenge everybody to look at that, and let's look at what really is moving around this nation in animals, um, in carcasses. This is uh, in Pennsylvania, and we seen a map yesterday, or a picture yesterday, I think it was out of Wisconsin. They're using these same uh, containers. Here's one that's done really nice. They uh, put the liner in there to keep every, all the juices from running out. They got it tied up pretty good. This one, they didn't do such a great job, you know, and... Uh, it actually is leaking fluids out right here. You know, we have whole heads in this. This dumpster sat a mile down the road from one of the larger deer farms in the state of Pennsylvania. I think we need to, you know, I, I applaud the wildlife agencies for coming up with a way to get rid of these carcasses, but I think we have to really question our placement of them. You know, we, should, we shouldn't be placing them within a mile of, a, of, a seed, of a farm facilities. And I think they need to be emptied more often. This wasn't emptied for nine days until after season. I don't think they gave people to hang time to, you know, age, age their meat or what. But for nine days, it sat out there, and the bears and the blackbirds and the ravens, grows, everything visited this dumpster. So, um, like I say, it, it, it's a problem that needs to be addressed. I don't really truly have all the answers for it. We need to do something. Another situation in uh, Pennsylvania, they used a low bidder apparently to, for the contractors to get who gets to pick up the road kills. But this is the neighbor of a positive facility that was just depopulated uh, in October. So just October, we had a deer farmer's livelihood taken away, put out of business. His neighbor, and this truck sits many days with these carcasses in it in the back of his driveway. Well, he gets it filled up. I don't know how often he goes to empty or dump. But that's his job, is to drive around and pick up road kills. Uh, 
and I don't know what do we do for picking up road kills in this state. I think yesterday one of the presenters I seen had something on road kills. Um, some little interesting news story I seen here. Um, uh, hang on. Uh, out of uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming now, outside of the uh, elk feeding grounds. Is Mary Wood still here? They uh, discovered a uh, roadkill positive mule deer. And it, it highlighted some of the areas there. The highlighting was added by me, but they're pretty sure that the carcass went to the dump. You know, the results weren't, didn't come back for a couple of weeks, so uh, they sampled it at least, thank God. But they hauled it out to the dump, and then he says there, uh, I'm pretty sure it's put on the landscape in the normal place. Uh, we believe it was rather promptly consumed by scavengers. You know, where'd the scavengers go with what they got rid of? Um, you go further down there, that, excuse me, that dump gets rid of 30 to 40 tons, tons of wildlife a year. So that is a problem. It's a real problem. That's just in Wyoming. And, you know, Mary talked about uh, how few deer they have and what their deer density is and um, the number of hunters are so low. What are these states like Wisconsin that have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of deer? doing. Thank you. Um, so I better speed up here. Got a lot of slides yet. There are still many challenges that allow uh, unregulated movement of hunter killed carcasses and poor disposal methods. Uh, some other risks that the industry faces. This is my own, per only, my own personal truck, environmental contamination. And I, I should flip back to that map but uh, of the North America and all those positives, but when you go to the very extreme top up in Saskatchewan, that's where I go bear hunting. And where all those thick, where the CWD problems is probably the worst, so I had to rethink what I'm doing now after seeing what happened here. But when I was up there, it rained for three days this past year. On the way home, I stopped twice and washed my truck, twice. Because it had, I bet, 500 pounds of mud hanging off it. So I thought I did a heck of a job after about an hour and I don't know how many loonies I stuck into that car wash, laid on my back and I washed and I hosed and then before I got to the border when I stopped for gas I noticed that I still had mud dripping out different places. So I went through another car wash and I washed the heck out of it again. I got home, so 700 miles uh, and later and I had my daughter take it to uh, Bismarck and run it through one of those fancy car washes, did the old under, underwash and all that and give it the coating and all that. So the neat thing about that is that's all waxed and everything right now. But uh, anyhow, a week later then, I was hooking up, getting ready to go on a trip and uh, I happened to lay under it for something and I glanced up and, and I hadn't been in any rain. It didn't rain in North Dakota much this year. But all this mud after three car washes and 700 miles of driving and two weeks of time is still hanging there. And there's nothing holding that up there. That's just ready to fall off whenever. So, um, and that came from the most highly concentrated CWD area of Saskatchewan that there is. White Fox up there, love Saskatchewan. That's right smack dab in the middle of it. So uh, that truck is now quarantined because we seen yesterday the, uh, the what they call it, the attachment rate or tack rate of certain metals and plastics of, uh, that hold, C hold prions. And this truck is, is full of a lots of that. So uh, that truck is no longer allowed in the, uh, in the breeder pens. Other challenges our industry faces, you know, uh, the alfalfa. That's uh, my daughter making hay there. That was uh, me on the baler, actually. I made a pass. I come back the next round, and I see something there. So I get off and I look at it, there's the skull, there's vertebrae's. Uh, the neat thing about it, um, yesterday we heard that Norway has put restrictions on importation of uh, hay from the US. Well, I have decided that I am now gonna impose my own sanctions and I will refuse to sell all hay to Norway at this time. <laughs> we have uh, sporadic occurrences, relationship to uh, scrapies, other TSCs such as BSE, mink, mink and feline, feline encephalopathy are all tied to scrapie. Why not CWD? You know, everything has a, uh, uh, you know, every TSC has a spontaneous form. Um, we see now, we heard about uh, a moose in Finland. This was like 15 miles from the Russian border. This is very, very remote. The reindeer in Norway, while they're remote, they're still out there with the people. They're still out where, the, where they're farming them. 
uh, this moose in Finland, and that is not the moose, but the moose in Finland that was found is remote. And that wasn't spread by, by a deer farmer in North America to that moose in Finland. So we need to really rethink is CWD maybe a naturally occurring disease? Can we spread it? Yes. Yes, we need to manage it. Yes, we need to learn to manage it. New disease no one's even talking about, the mad camel, um, camel encephalopathy. Uh, they, they got a prion disease now too found. So there's a lot of different prion diseases out there. And why we would think that CWD is a unique one or is the only one or is not related to all the rest of them, isn't somehow tied together. We hear a lot about is, is scrapey, did, did CWD originate from scrapey? I might flip that around and say, you know what, I think the cervids are here long before the domestic sheep industry. Did scrapey originate from CWD? Did it go the other way? Is it coming back? We know that at, uh, at one point, uh, the cervids in this country were just about uh, extirpated. You know, I, I just read an article in my home state, North Dakota, 1930, they figured there were only 10,000 deer left in the entire state. And uh, they held a season that year and shot 1,000 of them they canceled season for the next uh, three years. So uh, we have some conflicting science. Uh, some of the other challenges we face here, uh, Dr. Frank Bastian at LSU, you know, he doesn't buy into the prion theory. Uh, he's more into the bacteria, spiroplasma. I have no jury or judge on this at all, but I tell you what, I do think we should be keeping open minds and at this point in the time until someone has a solution or has something figured out or has a vaccine, we should explore all options because the prion side has had 50 years to look at it as well and hasn't really brought us much to the table. So I'm not saying I support one side or the other, I just support looking at them all. Another one I stumbled across while getting ready for this uh, conference, and this come out in April of 2017, so I don't know how I missed this. It really grabbed my attention, I seen CWD tuberculosis found in spongy form disease formerly attributed, you know, ties more into Alzheimer's, but the CWD stands for cell wall deficient. So it's not chronic wasting disease. But, but what it is, though, and it, it, is, it is tuberculosis being tied to, uh, to possibly BSE and to scrapie. So, and, and they really do question Prusner's prion theory. So back to uh, you know, Bastion's, is, I'm just saying, you know what, I think we need to, we need to keep some open, open minds here. Uh, just about done. The... Uh, Soils, we heard, uh, you know, yesterday are conflicting science. Some are saying clay binds it, clay amplifies it. Some are saying the sands do. We hear all types of different things. So um, one of the neat things uh, we're finding out, though, is, is there possibly some environmental mode that may actually get rid of prions, may control prions. Uh, and we've seen something on the lichens. And this was done out of a... Uh, I think one of those guys worked at the uh, USGS for several years. But anyhow, uh, some neat information here on possible uh, lichens controlling it. Here's another one that just recently came out November 30th of 2018. But the, uh, what acids are those? But uh, the hum humic acids possibly will clean up CWD. So, or other prions. I think that's something we need to look at here. As we talked, I said earlier about is CWD naturally occurring? Has it always been here? Is it in places, been there for hundreds of years, that some places it'll amplify and grow like crazy? We might move it to new areas. It might take hold, it might not. But uh, maybe not every environment will be conducive to, to chronic wasting disease. Um, we see that with uh, meningo worm, be tenuous. We have it here in your eastern part of Texas, if I'm correct, but not in the western half. You know, why does it not move? You know, and, and we, don't, we can say, well, it's just in the east, but it isn't in North Carolina, South Carolina, or Florida. You know, so... Um, th there are certain diseases that, uh, they say, need the right environmental conditions. Uh, real quickly on the federal rule, uh, we've been working hard to get these new program standards out. I hope, like heck, it seems like we always get them right before Christmas. Uh, I think Dr. Nichols said yesterday she thinks they're really close. You know, I would bet money almost on it that we're going to get those things like Christmas Eve. It seems like that's when we always do. But the neat thing, as I think Mitch had pointed out, is there is going to be a live testing component in them. Quick, uh, I'd like to hit on this urine-based scent bands. I know there's some talk now about the uh, um, semen band as well. People not moving embryos or moving semen. And I think we heard yesterday uh, Dr. Morales say that uh, they had to really amplify 
them, you know, yes, they can find prions, but to make it truly infectious, they had to really amplify it. So is there a risk there? Possibly. But it's so small that I think there's other things we need to work at. When you compare an ounce of, an ounce of urine or semen versus, you know, a postage stamp size of actually just be a meat that is allowed to move within the trade of, you know, cross state lines, um, the infectivity is not even close, you know, but yet we're worried about some of these. The one thing I would like to point out, like I said earlier, I know all the positive herds. Not one urine collector in this entire country and not one breeder buck, well-known breeder buck here, has ever been collected for urine or semen and been sold across these state lines, ever. So, you know, if we're on a witch hunt looking for possible reasons or possible ways, that yeah, that's might be a possibility, but it has never happened yet. So the spread or the movement, if we're trying to figure out where is it coming from, I can tell you it isn't coming from the urine industry, it isn't coming from the semen sales. So um, we want to keep an eye on them. This urine industry actually self-imposed some major restrictions above and beyond what the federal rule calls for, and uh, I support that. I think it's a good thing. At the same time, I oppose the states that are shutting them down just for the sake of doing something. You know, a knee-jerk reaction, when they, just so they can stand up and say, well, we got to do something. Well, there's lots of things we can do. You know, we looked at the hay, we looked at the mud, we looked at all the different things and the, the different risks that are out there. That risk in that urine sale, that little one-ounce bottle of pee that, you know, and I don't know why it is, you ever watch a deer pee, when they pee, they, they pee a quarter more. But a hunter buys a one-ounce bottle for $10, and he goes out in the woods and he puts three drops on his shoe, you know, and he keeps that thing for years. I mean, he hoards it like this is gold, you know. So anyway, the, the amount of that little one-ounce bottle isn't what's spread in this disease, did not spread it to Finland, did not spread it to Norway. Uh, just put it in an industry perspective, you know, where's CWD uh, to EHD and anthrax, human health risk. Um, We've got, I talked about the conflicting science again. We've seen a study, uh, got everybody excited about the uh, macaque monkeys up in Canada that were fed the raw meat, lots of raw meat, and then uh, possibility of an, uh, transmission. Uh, thank God the National Institute of uh, Allergy and Infectious Diseases did a study as well and said that they did not get transmission with macaque monkeys. I think we also had that with the spider monkeys. Uh, my personal feelings is... Uh, I'm never going to eat a sick macaque monkey anyway. So uh, I did see this when I was at the CWD symposium in, in uh, Michigan last or two years ago there. Uh, eat more venison, 10,000 wolves can't be wrong. So right here at the end, uh, needs. We need tools for environmental detection, better, better tools for environmental detection. We're getting there. Dr. Nichols has done it for years. Uh, hopefully someone who takes your place steps up to finish a lot of that. Uh, we need to assess impacts on host populations. I mentioned earlier about uh, 1930 when North Dakota only had 10,000 deer in the whole darn state. What is the, what is the natural population? What is, are we, you know, when I look at Wisconsin runs more deer per square mile than we run cattle in North Dakota on a square mile. I mean, that's, that's I don't know how their cattlemen can make a living competing against the deer. But what is, what is the, the density, the true density level, and is that having an impact on the diseases. We need to find alternative intervention tools, uh, sustainable long-term views. Uh, and there is studies now, thankfully, being uh, pushed through uh, Congress, and we support those, to try to understand that how the disease is truly transmitted among deer and elk. Um, last slide here, I think, because I'm getting, yeah, I'm right to dinner. The genetic research. The industry is pushing this hard. We are throwing all the money at it right now. I don't know any other source that's funding it. Hopefully we'll get some money through Congress. But there are, we look at right now 96, you know, and the, the GGs, the GS, or the SS, and the combination of, there's a lot more out there. Uh, being, work being right done, or done right here at uh, Texas Tech, Dr. Chris Seabury, he was mentioned yesterday, he's even identified another marker now that's possibly there. The more markers we can add to this, the better we can get. It ain't all about 96SS, though I will add, and the 96SS we heard today, I don't believe they've ever found a brain positive 96SS. Am I wrong in that? Does anybody else, can you correct me on that? There's never been a 96SS brain positive deer. Lymph node, yes. What's your lymph system supposed to do? Hopefully it's supposed to screen out the bad things and uh, maybe that's working. Uh, has there ever been a clinical deer of a 96SS? 
I don't believe so either. Uh, are they shedding? We don't know that. That's what needs to be done. That's why we need this money from Congress. We need the industry. We need uh, our wildlife officials. We need people to step up and, and do some of those studies to find out when do animals truly start to shed so we can carry forward with this genetic research and uh, possibly have a solution to a lot of this problem. Uh, I think Mitch was taking a lot of credit for the CWD live testing. I really like that. But this was April of 2014 at my farm when we ran my entire farm through, did nasal swabs, drew blood, and rectal biopsied the whole entire herd. I had the first certified live tested herd 2014. Um, but I do, I, I tell you what, Texas has done so much for live testing and that it's amazing. So we, I want to thank you for that. Um, the end. <laughs>